In this video, we will be going through the first lecture in chapter two, which is all about early atomic theory and some uh, introductory information regarding isotopes and atomic mass. So let's get right into it. So if we go into our earliest theories of matter, um, we actually can go all the way back to the earliest um, well-known ideas of Greek philosophy and civilization. So we're going back to the fifth century BCE. And where we go here is to a philosopher known as Democritus, and there were some others like him, that first bring up this idea of matter as this indivisible kind of substance. And so the idea was that if you break matter down into enough pieces, that the, we eventually get to something that you cannot break apart anymore. And those things that you could not break apart anymore were called atomos. Um, and this ends up being the derivative for what we would later call atoms. Now, somewhere between 50 and 100 years later, a uh, pair of much more well-known philosophers known as uh, Plato and Aristotle um, effectively conclude that Democritus and the other contemporaries of that time are wrong and that you can break matter up in infinite numbers of pieces. And this, along with several other factors, ultimately crush atomic theory. And we don't really see atomic theory brought up again in large part until the 17th century. So, you know, do a little bit of quick math in your head. This is nearly 2,000 years later that we start to see atomic theory kind of rear its head again. And one of the main reasons why is technology finally is able to adapt enough that we are able to show significantly that there is evidence for atoms. But we don't know at the time what it is that the atoms are made out of. So in the end, at least until this point, we are able to verify Democritus and to reject the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, at least on this point, and show that atoms do actually exist. And based on observations and theories of, of scientific laws at the time, John Dalton, in the 1800s is able to develop an overall grand theory of atoms um, that we will broadly refer to now as Dalton's atomic theory. And so inside Dalton's atomic theory, there are four primary postulates. That is, there are four statements of belief that we generally accept as true, or we're, at least were generally accepted as true uh, based upon the known evidence at the time. And each of these are pretty significant. For example, we know that an element is composed out of extremely small particles called atoms. We know this to be true. This is something that we fundamentally accept as true. Um, the second postulate, all atoms of a given element are identical, but atoms of different elements are different from each other. I'm going to kind of highlight this one because in general, we do accept that this is the case. In fact, our law of constant composition um, tells us that we should expect this to be the, so. However, when we later get into a discussion of isotopes, we will show that this idea of elements being identical to each other is not actually true. It has some elements of truth in it in that all atoms of a given element will have the same number of protons in their nucleus, but they will not actually be identical to each other. And the thing that makes different elements different from each other, again, comes back to the number of protons in the nucleus and not necessarily um, any other kind of thing. Number three, the elements 
The atoms of one element cannot be changed into atoms of another element by chemical reaction. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. We still verify this. This is still true. Um, the key word here is chemical reaction. Um, and we've got our conservation law. to thank for this one still being upheld. Now, some of you might be saying, well, what about in a nuclear reaction? Well, that is true. In a nuclear reaction, we can get atoms of one kind turn, turn into atoms of another kind. But again, that is a nuclear process, not a chemical one. The atom itself is physically and chemically breaking down um, and coming into different pieces and parts. So that is not a chemical reaction that's taking place. That is a nuclear reaction that's taking place. But the thing about number three is that number three ultimately ultimately disproves the practice of alchemy. Um, if you think about what was going on in the Middle Ages, um, and so, you know, by the time we hit the 1700s, we should, we are well out of the Middle Ages in Europe where Dalton is working, but the prop, the practice of alchemy is still somewhat common. Dalton's atomic proof theory ultimately puts the final nail in the coffin of alchemy by saying that, no, it is impossible. The law of conservation of matter says we can't get this to happen. It's never going to happen we have to let it go. And then the last part here, law um, number four, compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine, but a given compound always has the cell, same relative number and kind of atoms. So within this, we actually see two different laws being kind of uh, shown out here. The first one coming from this introductory statement um, we know that as the law of multiple proportions um, that tells us that when we get different atoms, when we get atoms of different elements combining together, we can get many different compounds. But the thing that is ultimately important in those cases is that in each of those compounds, we are going to have the same whole number ratio of one element to another. That is our law of definite proportions at play, um, which says that you know carbon and oxygen may form many different compounds, but carbon monoxide will always be one carbon to one oxygen. Carbon dioxide will always be one carbon to two oxygens. The oxalate ion will always be two carbons to four oxygens. So that's Dalton's atomic theory. Again, a really big step in the, in the history of science and in the history of chemistry, because if you think about where we were and how little had changed, how little things had developed over the course of the previous 2000 years, and even then some, this was a really important theory. And the fact that the majority of the things in this theory are still valid and even the one that isn't valid, um, again, going back to postulate number two, even though it is not valid as it is written exactly, it is still valid if we kind of massage some of the language to talk more about the nucleus itself or the protons that are in there. So now we move into some more modern aspects of atomic theory. Dalton deserves a lot of credit for kind of getting things started, grounding things in an appropriate way. But now we need to move past that to starting to talk about some other aspects of, the, of, um, of atomic theory. And so one of the places that we're gonna start is with J.J. Thompson himself. Thompson is um, largely credited for um, the cathode ray tube experiment. And what happened in the cathode ray tube experiment is um, Thompson set up a rather simple experiment. A lot of work had been done during the time on cathode rays. 
Now, cathode rays were relatively simple. You took some materials um, and you hooked them up to a battery. The battery hooks up and a beam of these uh, green phosphorescent um, substances come through. And it didn't matter what the material of the cathode and the anode were, we always got this green beam. Now, what was interesting about this green beam as it was going through this phosphorescent tube was that unlike light, which is kind of what was first thought when we saw this, unlike light, the green beam was actually responsive to electromagnetic fields. So we put it in a magnetic field like what you see here and we see that it is bending. It is actually bending toward the North Pole. We put it in an electrical field like this one, and we can see that the beam bends toward the positive pole. And so this indicated a couple of things to Thomson. First of all, the beam is particles, not light, because light would not behave in this way. Light does not attract itself toward a, a, um, a magnetic or an electrical field. And the other thing is that the beam has a negative charge. And the reason why we can say that it has a negative charge is because of the way that it was operating inside of these electric fields. If it had a positive charge, it would have bent away from the positive pole and toward the negative pole, but instead it goes toward the positive and away from the negative, which means it has a negative charge. Now, based upon this information, Thomson is able to determine the rate, the ratio between the, the, the charge and the mass, but he doesn't know what the charge or the mass is. So he knows that something is there he knows it has a negative charge, but he doesn't necessarily know what to do with that negative charge or how to use it. So it comes upon Robert Millikan about 10 years later to devise an experiment. And this is a really elegant experiment, really, really nice experiment um, to help to determine what the charge is. And if we can determine what the charge is, using the charge to mass ratio, we can determine what the mass is as well. So Milliken's experiment is called the oil drop experiment. What he is using is he's got a two chambered vessel here, and we can see that the second chamber is separated by the first, by this plate. So this is the plate that separates the chamber one from chamber two. And so what happens is that in chamber one, we have an atomizer that is filled with oil. Now an atomizer is a really fancy way of saying spray bottle, but the spray bottle that we're using here is a very, very, very fine spray. We're getting very, 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 very tiny droplets of oil being utilized here. And so what we do, what we can see is that the positive, the atomizer sprays this really, really fine mist of oil and the oil manages to go through this very tiny hole in that positively charged plate. And as it is going through that hole, we are going to see that it gets blasted with x-rays. And so the x-rays are ionizing radiation. They are going to um, basically make it so that there are negative charges on all of these oil drops. And what Milliken does is by using the plates here, we've got a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate based upon gravity and the electrical fields that he's able to generate, he's going to evaluate how charged these oil drops are as they go. And what he's able to determine is that every single oil droplet falls down into a charge that is always divisible by this number. 
1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And so what he determines is that since this is kind of the base unit, this must be what the charge of an electron is. If this is the charge of the electron, then the, char the mass of the electron using the charge to mass ratio must be this, 9.109 times 10 to the negative 28th grams. So now with this information, the combination of Thomson and Millikan are able to determine, okay, we know what the mass of an electron is. We know what the charge of an electron is. Let's take a, a stab at trying to devise a atomic theory that utilizes this information and further expands upon Dalton's work. And the model that comes up here is called the plum pudding model. Now the plum pudding model is extremely primitive in its design. Again, not a whole lot is known. All that is known about atoms is that there are these electrons in them. And if there are negative charges inside of the atom, that means that there must be positive charges somewhere as well. Since we don't know anything about positive particles, the plum pudding model basically says that we've got these electrons that are just kind of stuck in this matrix of positive charge. And so we've got these electrons that are kind of evenly distributed throughout this positively charged sphere. The positively charged sphere contains all of the electron, or excuse me, all of the positive charge to counterbalance all of the negative charges of all of those electrons. A primitive model, yes, but not bad for what was known at the time. And so while all of this is going on, there's other discoveries that are being made as well. Radioactivity is one of the most common ones. Now, radioactivity was first noticed by Henri Becquerel in the late 19th century, so just before the turn of the century. Again, if you think about when Thomson's work was going on in the late 19th, early 20th century, Becquerel is doing the same things at the same time. And what he finds is that some materials are able to produce this invisible radiation. And the invisible radiation that they produce gives us these charged particles. And so we get a whole new branch of physics and chemistry as a result of this discovery. It's called radioactivity. And the radioactivity involves the study of these spontaneous emissions from these high energy particles. Now, the two primary parts of the radiation that are found are beta particles. Beta particles, given by the Greek letter beta here, are high energy electrons overall. And alpha particles, shown by the Greek letter alpha here, uh, which are particles that are quite massive. In fact, they have the same mass as a helium nucleus, so two protons and two neutrons. But they also have a positive two charge, which means that unlike helium, which would have two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons, the electrons are missing from the alpha particle. Now, Becquerel is not the only person that is working on this. There are actually a number of, of labs that are working on this at the same time. In fact, in Becquerel's lab, um, there are two scientists, Henri, or I'm sorry, uh, there's Henri himself. There's also Pierre Curie and his wife, Marie Curie. Um, people you might have heard of for their work with radioactivity and in particular radium and uranium as well. But going away from the Curies and Becquerel for a while here, one of the applications for the radiation that the, Bec that the Curie and Becquerel lab ultimately uncover is that we can use radioactive particles and because they will spontaneously emit these high energy, high charge, high mass substances, we can actually use that to our advantage. And so Ernst Rutherford in the early 20th century comes up with an experiment that is going to use alpha particles. 
And so what he does is he has these alpha particles sitting in this box. This box here is lined with lead in all directions other than one. And so what this allows is since lead will absorb alpha particles, this is essentially going to make it so that the alpha particles are going to be shot in one direction as a beam toward this little piece of gold foil. And all around that gold foil are going to be this fluorescent screen so that we can see where the alpha particles go once they encounter the gold foil. Now under the plum pudding model, what we would have expected to see is that as these particles encounter the gold foil, so let's draw in our gold foil here. As these particles interact with this gold foil, we would expect that under the plum pudding model, they would go pretty much straight through. And the reason why, under the plum pudding model, the only things that might get encountered by these very, very, very heavy particles are some electrons. And those electrons, considering how small they are in mass, relative to the size of the alpha particle, would do nothing more than to maybe just skip off of it, but largely stay on the same path. So this is what was expected. What they saw instead though, was kind of shocking. The majority of the alpha particles did go straight through the gold foil. But the ones that didn't weren't just slightly deflected as what would have been expected. They were shot off at massive angles, which kind of puts a whole damper on this idea that the gold foil was going to act like this. It didn't do that at all. Instead, what we saw is that these massive deflections had to have been occurring. And where the only way that that could have made sense is if there was a very compact center, there are very compact piece or pieces inside of that gold foil that would have encountered those alpha particles and caused them to interact in the way that they did. So very, very curious. The results that happened here were not expected at all. And as a result, they required a new model to be devised. This is what becomes known as the nuclear atom. Now, Rutherford and later contemporaries around Rutherford, which we'll discuss more in chapters uh, three and so on, um, will devise different ways as new information comes out to try to understand and um, create better models. But they all kind of focus on this idea of a nuclear atom. That is, we have a nucleus. The nucleus is positively charged in the middle of the atom and it contains nearly all of, the all of the mass of the atom itself. But in terms of its size, the nucleus itself is about one ten thousandth of the volume of the atom itself. So we've got this massive atom, but most of the mass is contained in a very tiny point in the middle of it. Now inside of that nucleus, we are later uh, able to prove that there are both positive and neutral particles inside of the nucleus. Um, James Chadwick ultimately does the uh, experiment to devise that there are neutral particles in there as well. And so we determine that there are protons, which are positive in their charge, and there are neutrons, which have no charge whatsoever. Both are present at the same time in this particular um, atom. And so pictorially speaking, we can look at this and see, okay, if this 
represents my entire atom, which for gold is about 288 picometers across. One one hundredth of one of those picometers would actually be represented by the nucleus itself. Do a little bit of quick math there. That's um, about you know two twenty-eight thousand, twenty-nine thousand, uh, one twenty-nine thousandth of the diameter. So we've got a very very large atom. We've got a very 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 small nucleus. But inside that nucleus, we can see that there are both neutrons and protons present at the same time. Now, in summary, for our subatomic particles, we can see that the proton and the neutron have roughly the same mass. The electron has considerably less mass. Actually, the neutron is just, or excuse me, the proton and neutron are about 2,000 times, a little bit less than 2,000 times um, larger in mass than the electron itself. From a charge standpoint, the neutron has no charge. The proton and electron have equal but opposite charges. But we don't tend to usually phrase things in terms of these raw numbers. What we will do more often than not is we will deal with things in terms of relative amounts. So the proton and the neutron, since they have roughly the same charge, we're gonna give them a general mass number of one. So when we're talking about the mass number of a, a nucleus or of an atom or an isotope, we're gonna be looking at how many protons does it have? How many neutrons does it have? The electron itself, even though they do technically have mass, has so little mass relative to protons and neutrons that we consider their mass to be negligible. That's why it's zero there. We do the same kinds of things for charge. Instead of dealing in these tiny, tiny numbers, we talk about positive charge and negative charge. Proton has a positive one charge, electron has a negative one charge, Neutron has no charge whatsoever. And so this brings us to our discussion of isotopes. Now, again, we alluded to the idea that the Dalton atomic theory had a blind spot when it came to isotopes. Um, at that point, no evidence had been brought about for why isotopes exist the way that they do. Um, it wasn't until there were uh, later tests that were able to show how different samples, or excuse me, how a sample of a particular element could actually split up into multiple masses based upon different isotopes that we were able to prove definitively that they existed. But what is common for any isotope is that the element will always have the same number of protons, but what makes an isotope an isotope is the fact that it has different amounts of neutrons. So an element is an element based upon its number of protons, but if there are different numbers of neutrons present, we're still dealing with the same element, but now we're dealing with different isotopes of that same element. And we can refer to an individual isotope of a particular element as a nuclide. Now, when it comes to nuclide uh, symbology here, this is probably the most common form of symbolism that there is. Um, this is AZX notation. Um, the A here represents the mass number, that is the total number of nucleons in that nucleus. So A is protons plus neutrons. Z refers to the atomic number itself. The atomic number tells us the number of protons in the nucleus, and because that is also tied to the identity of the element, we get the identity as well. X is our elemental symbol. These are the symbols that are found on the periodic table, and the symbol is a one or two letter symbol to identify what the atom is. Now there's one piece on here that is missing, um, that is sometimes present, and 
for lack of a better term, we're just gonna to refer to this as lowercase n. Lowercase n is going to refer to the charge on the nuclide. And we can find the charge by taking the number of protons and some tracking from it, the number of electrons in that particular nuclei. Um, so you'll see sometimes where it'll say, you know, um, krypton, no charge. Um, so in that case, protons and electrons are the same. You might see um, sulfur minus two. That means that there are two more electrons in the sulfur ion than there are protons. Um, or you might see aluminum plus three. That means that there are three more protons than electrons. So just something to kind of keep, a, keep an eye out for um, as you're working through some of these kinds of problems. Before we move on, I do wanna make one distinction very clear. This is probably one of the most common things that happens when uh, we run into problems uh, with chemistry. And this is the confusion between mass numbers and atomic masses. Um, happens every semester, happens in pretty much any course that I teach that deals with this concept is people confusing these two ideas with each other. Again, when we refer to mass number, what we are talking about is the total number of particles in the nucleus. That is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Um, and by contrast, atomic mass is simply just the average mass of an element. Now, how do we get that average mass? Well, we take a weighted average for every isotope that exists for that particular element. And so we can find that by taking the percent abundance for a given isotope multiplied by its individual mass. And I just recognize there is a mistake on this. Let's fix that real quick. And we take that and we add that to the abundance for uh, a different isotope multiplied by its mass. And we take that and we add it to the abundance for a third isotope multiplied by its mass. And we just repeat that process over and over and over and over again until we run out of isotopes. Now, for most cases, um, the number of prominent isotopes for a substance that would actually contribute to its overall isotopic mass ends at about three or four, um, even though there are, you know, as many as eight or nine isotopes available in some cases. Um, most, most, uh, most elements um, only have you know, two, three, or four that actually have a significant enough abundance to make a difference in terms of the overall atomic mass. And we'll do more with this in our next lecture. I just wanted to kind of make you aware of it because it is an easy place to make a mistake. So let's do some practice problems. First practice problem, write the symbols in the AZX form for the following nuclides. The first one has six protons and seven neutrons. Now in this scenario, again, if we are not given any information about electrons, we can assume that the substance is neutral. And so to that end, we do not have to worry about charge here. We just have to worry about um, atomic mass and, or excuse me, atomic number and mass number. Again, atomic number is equal to the number of protons. So that is six. And again, that is Z. The mass number is equal to protons plus the neutrons. So that would give us a total of 13, which is A. Six protons tells us the identity of X, which is carbon. I'm a symbol for carbon is C. So all I need to do is just kind of put all of that together. 
in one place. So I've got my symbol is carbon. My mass number is 13. And my atomic number is six. There is no charge here, so I don't need to put anything here at all. In part B, let's choose a different color. My, I'm dealing with 95 protons and 146 neutrons. So my atomic number in this case is equal to 95. And that is my Z value. My mass number is equal to 95 plus 146. which is equal to um, 241. And so that is my value for A. And then finally, I have 95 protons. That's gonna be, help me get my symbol um element number 95 on the periodic table is good old americium which is am so my symbol is going to look like this i've got americium am as my symbol i've got my mass number of 200 and 41 on top, my atomic number of 95 on the bottom. And again, no charge here because um, I haven't been given any information about electrons. All right, let's do one more example problem. Um, so, here, I'm given different bits of information. I'm gonna wanna put them together to try to figure out um, what I'm doing. So from that perspective, my atomic number 39 would also mean that I have 39 protons. My mass number of 89 with my atomic number of 39, 89 minus 39 would give me 50 neutrons in total. Now, element number 39 is yttrium Y. A um, couple of different directions I can go with this, but again, I'm not given any information about electrons or charge, so I'm just going to go with an even number here. So my symbol, I would have a mass number of 89 an atomic number of 39 and my symbol would be Y for yttrium. There you go. All right, now we're given something in reverse. Again, without any information about charge, we can assume that protons and electrons are the same which means that I have 15 protons to match the 15 electrons. My mass number is gonna be the sum of the protons and the neutrons, 15 plus 16 is 31. My atomic number is my proton number, so 15 here again. My symbol, just like before, mass number first, 31. Atomic number second, 15. 
Look to the periodic table. Element number 15 is P phosphorus. So I've got that one set up as well. Now notice in example number three, I'm actually being given charge information as well. Um, my atomic number and my mass number are actually the same. So the first part of this is pretty easy. My atomic number is 15. My mass number is 31. With an atomic number of 15, I'd have 15 protons. With a mass number of 31 and an atomic number of 15, 31 minus 15 would give me 16 neutrons. Number of electrons, I got to look at charge. Remember, charge is equal to protons minus electrons with a negative three charge and 15 protons. I can do a little bit of uh, algebra here, negative three plus electrons is equal to 15. So if I add three to both sides, I would get electrons equal to 18. So there are 18 electrons in this particular species. So that concludes this particular lecture on isotopes and our early versions of atomic theory. Um, if you have questions about any of the material in this lecture, please uh, send me a message in Remind or bring your questions with you to our next lecture, and I'll be happy to address them then. But until then, have a good day, and I'll see you next time in lecture.